Thanks. I've been to this meetup a few times. It's always an awesome time, and I, uh, I'm glad I have a chance to uh, present to you guys. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I started out my career at, uh, I've been all over the place, kind of uh, FLIR systems, doing infrared cameras. Uh, I did a little stint at a uh, Department of Energy Research Lab in Santa Barbara. I was in Apple previously, and now I'm at NEO, which is the uh, new name of uh, Next EV, which is a Chinese uh, electric vehicle startup based in North San Jose and Shanghai and Munich. So it's kind of a global situation. So um, I think that's an awesome achievement with the, uh, the previous uh, presenter did making a VNA. So it's going to be a kind of a tough act to follow, but I'm going to uh, keep up with the theme of not claiming to be an expert in everything I'm talking about. So I've been at NEO doing electric vehicle stuff for maybe about nine months now. So like. I wouldn't claim to be an automotive expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm definitely on a journey learning a new terminology and uh, uh, different ways to uh, solve problems. And so I consider myself more of like a Silicon Valley like automotive engineer. So um, as a hobby, I really enjoy doing really tiny circuit boards. So uh, on the screen here, this is a uh, it's kind of a clone of the uh, micro Python board that I did, um, which is. Uh, I think uh, Chris has talked about that, that in the past. And uh, I brought one with me. So uh, this is what I did over my Christmas holiday, making this little tiny board. So I'll pass this around. But with the uh, standard macro fab uh, lead time, it only just recently arrived, so I haven't really had a chance to bring it up. So if, uh, if anybody actually knows what they're doing and can help me bring up MicroPython on this thing, then I'll just straight up give it to you. Like tonight, so uh, come find me afterwards if uh, that's something that you're interested in. So um, I kind of got a couple different things I wanted to talk about, and uh, I'm in a group doing vehicle networking. Um, so if you think about a car, it's got like 70 of these little ECUs in there. And they control everything from an ECU is an electronic control module, or if you uh, there's a, a subset of it called an engine control module, but in the in the most general sense, it's just an electronic control module. And there will be one for like the wiper blades, and there's one for like the uh, rain sensor and light sensor, and you know the, the trunk opening module and the door lock and everything else. And these things all have to be networked together with actual wires. So uh, this is kind of the theme that you should guys keep in mind when you're uh, listening to the rest of my presentation. So this is a kind of a view of a uh, wiring harness inside of a car. And this thing's a disaster because there's actual people who have the title senior wire harness engineer. And they have to do, and the, the lead time of this thing is horrible, and it's expensive, and it's heavy, and it's just, so, uh, that sounds like a supply chain question, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How much does it weigh? That's a good question, too. That's a mechanical question. <laughs> but anyway, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to convey the point that you get extra points for minimizing the number of wires in this thing. So. When you're uh, looking at the most common vehicle networks on these things, they are, they're all high-speed serial buses. There's no, you know, like ribbon cables or anything like that. So you have the CAN bus, two wires, LIN bus, one wire. There's FlexRay, most, and Open. And I'm going to talk the most about CAN bus and LIN bus. Uh, but here's a here's like a basic overview of the different applications where all these things make sense. So if you have a on the um, the y-axis here is there's LIN. Um, and as the bandwidth increases, the speed roughly increases, with the exception of the top one, which is broader reach, uh, which I kind of added as after sight. So the broader reach is actually kind of comparable in cost to the flex ray, um, but that's neither here nor there. And in terms of the application, uh, there is low bandwidth control, so you can have something where maybe you're, you're uh, controlling the, uh, the, the windows rolling up and down. So that's like hardly a time critical application. So you don't really need to have a fiber optic real time link for that. But if something you're doing like autonomous driving and steering or braking or anything like that, then that definitely has to be deterministic. So there's also infotainment, which is the highest, probably the highest bandwidth application in most cars today. Um, and then safety stuff, which should probably get pr pretty high priority. So. Um, Here's uh, kind of a network diagram that you will commonly see at an automotive company. And this is how you're going to organize all the different subsystems and networks inside of the car. So to the, uh, to the left here, the purple one is the, this is a, kind of an example from a BMW style of an automobile. So the KCAN P and the KCAN S. 
is, uh, is both the body electronics and all these things, there's, there's different acronyms for things and you kind of need a glossary to do that to understand what these means, but they could be like the, the window motor or the, uh, the, the fog lamps or the puddle lamps or anything. All those kind of subsystems will have their own little block and they'll all be connected on a different bus to a central computer, which is called the uh, automotive connected gateway. And that's this, uh, the red box in the middle here. And connected to this is a diagnostic bus, which is the ODB port that you guys plug into if you ever try to uh, take it to the mechanic and read the diagnostic codes. But um, the connected gateway router is going to have different interfaces to it. It's going to have CAN buses, LIN buses. It'll, it might have PSI5. It might have MOST or FlexRay or Ethernet. So, so all those kind of come together in the, uh, in the automotive term. For, I kind of think of it as a uh, router and a firewall. Um, so, and one of the common kind of processors that you're, you're going to use is, is something like this. This is pretty common. And the way you uh, see it for, um, the way you can recognize that it's a gateway processor is that it's going to have many different uh, e um, external interface ports. So this particular one that I found is a flex scan and it's got LIN and it's got DSPI, which is kind of the same thing as SPI, but a little bit different. But um, kind of one of the things that I've noticed in automotive is that they, they go a lot slower in development than, than uh, consumer electronics does. So if you notice, this particular one is actually like a power PC core, which if you're not happening to design a car, there's no reason why you'd ever use a power PC core, uh, as far as I know. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you that the ARM version of this isn't even sampling until later this year. So um, it's kind of this, this kind of stuff kind of lags um, consumer development, I've noticed in, in a lot of ways. So uh, moving on to CAN bus, uh, it's, it's a very common bus for automotive. It's a multi-master system where you, you put all these modules in parallel together. And all you, you can kind of think of it as an open drain equivalent system, but if you look on the lower left, it kind of represented the signals there where um, if no module is doing anything, it becomes recessive. So there's a common voltage of two and a half volts on both of the signals. And, um, and that's actually a logic one. But if you become dominant on the bus, then you, you drive the can high and you drive the can low. And so you get a differential voltage on it. And that's the, uh, the dominant phase. And, and one of the advantages of this is it's a differential system. So it's very resistant to common mode noise. And you can actually have uh, tens of volts separating the grounds of these different ECUs, and it'll still uh, transmit data perfectly fine. So I've, I found a, just a representative example of a CAN transceiver chip, which is uh, something you would hang off of your microcontroller with a CAN peripheral on it. But if you notice, the, the output you're allowed to put plus or minus 60 volts on there, and then there's a differential voltage of plus or minus 120 volts. So it's, it's very resilient to any kind of common mode or differential noise that you can put on this thing. So here's uh, some measurements I took of a, an actual CAN uh, bus. So this yellow trace right here is the, the input to this uh, CAN transceiver. And all it does is just basically make a differential. So all the protocol intelligence lives on the peripheral inside of the microcontroller. So the CAN high, CAN low are these two traces up here. And for no reason whatsoever, there's kind of like junk on there but I did a difference function on the oscilloscope. So you can see, even with all this stuff, it's very, very solid, logic levels high and low, and that's just, that's just on a desk. So if you imagine on a car where you have maybe alternators starting up or you know, the engine revving, this stuff's gotta work because this is usually the, the more safety critical kind of things. And um, just, uh, it's kind of the most technical I wanted to get into the, uh, the actual structure of the CAN bus because this is all kind of software to me and as a, kind of an integration board level hardware engineer. You actually don't need to deal with this kind of stuff very often, but, but this is kind of uh, the structure. And there's a lot of features in here that helps you detect for errors and, and uh, prevent bus contention. And if you notice this uh, blue thing right here, that's the only part of the, the message frame where you're actually transmitting data. So the uh, throughput of this bus is actually kind of not, uh, not super high. So there's an extension of, of CANFD. So CANFD, or a classical CAN, will go up to maybe one megabit per second. And um, one kind of interesting thing that I learned was uh, on this uh, identifier bit right here. So the address of every node has its own address, and the address is also its priority. So on the uh, time when the, the clock's going through, the, the first 
node that asserts a dominant bit on the identifier pan, that guy is usually the, the master, so, or that one has the highest priority. So if that guy wants to talk, then he gets control of the bus. But there's also a start of frame, there's, there's CRCs in here, there's delimiter bits. So uh, it's, it's, it's very well defined. But there's, luckily, there's protocol analyzers, so you can leverage those kind of tools if you ever need to analyze the bus. Uh, this can go up to uh, quite usually one megabit per second. And there's, um, there's an extension of CAN called CANFD, which uh, extends the data field from up to eight bytes to 64 bytes. And then it'll straight up uh, speed up the clock, so you can get up to, uh, I think, five megabits is common. So five megabits, one megabit is still not that fast in terms of the, the kind of links that you're used to dealing with in normal electronics. Um, in terms of the... Uh, Error detection is very important for a, a safety critical CAN bus. And there's a, like five classical ways to detect bus. So there is a bus monitoring where the uh, every CAN transceiver or every CAN transmitter is also reading the bus at the same time. So if there's any bus contention, then it will be able to see that hey, I'm trying to assert one and or I'm, or I'm trying to assert a recessive bit and somebody's trying to assert a dominant bit. So if there's any mismatch between what you're trying to send and what you're reading then that'll flag an error. Uh, also, another feature that it has is bit stuffing. So at any time during the CAN message, you're only allowed to send five consecutive bits at the same time. And then at that point, then the, uh, the, the kind of the CAN uh, controller inside the IC is supposed to add a, a stuff bit of the opposite, opposite polarity. So that way, uh, it, it kind of helps with timing. And, and if something gets stuck, then you'll know about it pretty quickly. There's also a, a frame check, which uh, uh, looks for these uh, delimiter bits. So like the delimiter bit here, delimiter bit there, start of frame, uh, that kind of stuff. So if that stuff's not there in the proper place, then that'll flag an error also. And there's also an acknowledgement check. So there's a bit in there that's reserved for if you're a master trying to communicate to a node, then every other slave node is supposed to acknowledge that it received a, uh, the message. And, and then every node can also calculate its own CRC. So if there's any mismatch there, then it'll, it, it can flag an error as well. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, the CAN implementation with the uh, transceiver. So in this picture right here, you see you have a controller, and it has a transceiver, which is always a discrete component. Well, it's almost always a discrete component that you need to put on there. But if you don't happen to be in a situation where you're going to experience large um, like common mode voltages, shifts, or you know, ground potential differences or anything like that, then you can pretty easily get away with not using the transceiver. Like, say you have two devices that want to talk to each other over CAN on the same board, and it's going to be an electrically clean situation, then all you need to do really is kind of fake being a, uh, an, open, an open drain thing, because since the receivers are all connected together, obviously that's no problem. But all you have to do is prevent the, the drivers from fighting each other for bus contention. So you can actually accomplish this with a pull-up on the, on the CAN rail, but also you have to block the drive from the transmitter pin. And uh, Microchip has actually made this easy for you in, if you happen to use, be using a PIC controller. So here's a data sheet from the uh, PIC 18F microcontroller. And there's actually a bit on there that um, if you're using the CAN peripheral, a uh, the CAN TX pin will become tri it'll become high impedance when it's recessive instead of uh, instead of like trying to drive it high or low. So that way, if you happen to use one of those microcontrollers, then you can just connect the CAN together on like this microcontroller, this microcontroller, and this one on the same board without using any CAN transceiver at all. So, so um, the, the CAN transceiver is basically there to add protection and stuff like that. So uh, on the LIN bus. So Linbus is uh, kind of similar to a UART, except for it adds an extra uh, like preamble, and it becomes a, it's a one-wire um, protocol. So I, I got a, a block diagram of a, a Lin transceiver that you can download off the internet, and basically you can see that there is a basically only one uh, pin here on Lin, and and uh, I got a scope shot of a Lin transaction. So this is the input of a Lin transceiver. So you can see it looks a lot like UART, except for the, uh, the, the start bits and 
in that. And then all that happens at the output is it basically level shifts it to whatever your, your battery voltage is, which could be 12 volts. And this is what a uh, common LIN bus uh, frame looks like. So LIN bus is commonly used in lower priority non-time critical things, like the, uh, the window motor, or if you have like a rain sensor or a light sensor or something like that, that'll be on a LIN because it's only one wire. Um, so the uh, common way that the, uh, the frame is structured is that it's gonna have a, a sync break at the front and that'll signify to every slave node that uh, something's about to happen and then it'll just send just like ones and zeros for a whole byte. And that's used, uh, it's kind of a continuous calibration measure. So every slave can uh, calibrate his clock back to the transmitter's clock. Um, so the kind of interesting thing about this is that there's only one master in a common LIN bus and there could be up to uh, maybe 16 slaves on the LIN bus. So only the master is allowed to generate this purple thing and the slave responds with the uh, orange data field. So the way that the master can communicate to the slave is that the master is also a slave. So if the bus is trying to, to uh, send data from a master to a slave node, then it'll form this header such that the master is his own slave. So at that point, master to slave communication is that the master sends its, its uh, header, header format and then the master also sends a slave format. The, the, the slave field also. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to uh, LIN bus. Um, so this is a kind of an interesting thing that I've only seen in automotive, which is, uh, it's called broad R reach. And this is just normal 10, 100 ethernet, uh, except for they, uh, they run the bus twice as fast, so they kind of uh, mux the TX and RX onto one data pair. So the, um, Kind of the consortium name for that is the Open Alliance, which stands for the, the one pair ethernet. But this is uh, actually kind of a big deal because um, in my experience, software people, they love ethernet way more than they love CAN or SPI or, or anything like that. So you can just do normal ethernet and the only thing you have to do is buy this broad R reach or open phi. And then you can put data over two pairs and it's, uh, it's a full duplex with respect to a normal uh, 10 100 ethernet, but um, I mean, since there's only two pairs, so data's only going one way or the other, so it's kind of like quasi full duplex, but it, it actually works really well, so. Um, so new, uh, new automotive development is it's very, very heavy, heavily favored towards this broader reach thing. And then as an extension of broader reach, you can actually put power on top of the two data lines. So this is kind of like uh, power over ethernet, but in the case of normal ethernet, you have two pairs of wires, so you can use one pair of wires as the, uh, as the power and the other pair as the return, but you don't really have that in this case. So you have to use these magnetics to kind of put power on one half of the, uh, of the link and then ground on the other. And you can actually put up to 50 watts in this thing, which is, uh, which is pretty impressive. So if you think back to the automotive wiring harness, all you have to do is run a single, uh, twisted pair of wiring harness to every control module inside of the uh, car, and then you can give it power and data. So this is, uh, this is kind of gonna be like the next like big thing in, in automotive for uh, new vehicles in the future. So uh, here's kind of a uh, thing I was curious about, like how ubiquitous these different interfaces are. So I kind of invented a measure of uh, ubiquity of these different interfaces, and I went on DigiKey, and I searched for a microcontroller with, uh, with I2C or UART. So as you can see, uh, it's, it's not scientific at all, but there's the most number of parts you can buy that are active and in stock as of last week in DigiKey, and then UART, and then LIN is the, uh, the most common automotive interface, and there's CAN, um, Ethernet, FlexRay. So FlexRay is kind of, uh, it's used in some uh, BMW vehicles, and I think uh, like Audi, things like that, but uh, that's kind of being supplanted by, by uh, the two-wire ethernet. So uh, just shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, uh, like board level circuit design. Um, so you guys have probably noticed that if you ever search for components, you can get them qualified to, to AEC, which is the, the Automotive Electronics Council. And there's uh, different standards that apply to if you're an integrated circuit or a 
a diode or a MOSFET or a, a passive component altogether like an inductor or a capacitor. So there's a, um, wait for that. So there's different temperature grades that you can buy. Um, and they, uh, the, the ones that kind of are applicable to different uh, modules inside of a car are as if you're in the passenger compartment, like say you're, you're in like the, uh, the dashboard or something like that, then you might only be subject to uh, grade three, which is minus 40 to 85, because that's kind of the, ex that would be very extreme temperatures for even a person to experience. But if you're under a hood, then the, the temperatures can be a lot more extreme. So the spec is only related to temperature? Um, yeah, so, so uh, here's an example of what the specification dives into. And there's all kinds of rando stuff they look at, like like how strong the bond wires are, and, and if you like put humidity on it, you can survive vibration, and stuff like that. And each of these have their own like JDEC test method and um, like moisture sensitivity level and stuff like this. So you should, as a uh, system integrator, you should be happy that like on semiconductors doing this stuff for you, and they you just take their word that it, it passed the uh, AEC uh, specification that applies to it. And uh, here's another thing that um, is uh, I'm learning is common to automotive, which is uh, PPAP. Um, I couldn't even find any cool graphic to go along with this, but it's basically a way to guarantee that the components you buy are, you know, approved. I guess I don't know. So. I'll let you guys read through that, and I'll take a swig of my PBR. <laughs> so here's an example of an automotive uh, qualified diode. So you can notice that if it's uh, a, if they went through the trouble of qualifying it for AEC, then they'll advertise it, and also it's PPAP capable. They'll let you know that too, and a lot of times they'll have a, a unique part number. So this will be the basic part number where you don't know where it's made, but this NRV prefix, it says it was made in their particular fab in you know, Malaysia or wherever it happens to be. Um, and I've, uh, I've been learning that different vendors kind of handle this differently. So uh, Linear Tech, for instance, everything they make, uh, for the most part, either it already is AEC qualified or can be AEC qualified. But uh, someone like TI, on the, on the other hand, all of their components that are intended for automotive, they actually need to uh, decide that they're going to make it an automotive component from the, the beginning design phases. So they'll do all their uh, failure failure mode analysis like right at the beginning. So it's, um, by the time it, it, it hits this end product where it has a data sheet and you can actually buy it, if it, actually, if it says AEC, then uh, you can be assured that there's a lot of work that went into that. Um, now, I'm talking about components in terms of board level hardware design. Um, I mean, resistors and inductors, I couldn't wait, find it, figure out a way to make that interesting, but uh, capacitors are, are pretty cool. So everyone's probably familiar with ceramic capacitors, which are basically these electrodes separated by ceramic. And what I didn't necessarily know before was that the ceramic itself, they, uh, they kind of tweak the chemistry of that. So um, this is kind of uh, the time axis on the, on the left. and. Uh, on the right is the, or on the y-axis is the density axis. So these different electrodes might be separated from anywhere from 1.7 microns to, uh, in the most recent example, is, is uh, half of a micron. So in a lot of cases, you'll use these for bypassing applications. So I mean, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be relying on half of a micron of ceramic to uh, prevent your whole system from shorting out? So that's, that's one of the things that um, is a known failure mode that you have to think about. So uh, some of the ways that you can design around that are these uh, soft termination capacitors. And this is just one of the ways that, that uh, capacitor manufacturers make their product more reliable. So these are a very brittle um, thing. So uh, any, any board flex at all will cause a ceramic to just straight up crack. Um, but uh, if you buy an AEC component that uh, usually uh, requires a little more bending ability than a, a normal capacitor, but in this case, uh, this manufacturer, they put a, a layer of uh, a flexible epoxy in the thing, and that'll actually allow the board to flex like 50% more before it, before it experiences a crack. So 
So this is a, a thing you can do at the cost of a few extra milliamps of uh, series resistance, but it's uh, usually a good trade-off. So. Another thing that uh, I'm uh, kind of noticing in, in uh, this is more in high voltage electron in high voltage situations, but uh, so a normal capacitor is uh, shown on the left here. And if you, if you can imagine a crack happening anywhere around here, we'll just short this capacitor out. So it's kind of a really nasty failure mode. But uh, they have these uh, series design capacitors where it's pretty much two in one. So there's uh, one capacitor, two capacitors. So if, so imagine this capacitor experiences a mechanical crack on this right side. So maybe the right capacitor will short out, but the left one will still be OK. So this is another way to, it basically combines two capacitors in one package. And um, it's worth noting that this will only prevent an, a, a mechanical short. So if you're abusing it electrically, like you're going over the rated voltage, then you're not really guaranteed to get the uh, reliability increase that this promises. And um, another thing that they do is uh, they'll reduce the density of the capacitance by making the overlapping plates uh, kind of uh, pull back from the, uh, the edges of, the, of the, uh, the component. So if you remember in the previous design, the capacitor overlapping here goes all the way to the end, and that's the way to, to increase the, maximize the, the density of, of charge that this, that this component could store. This one, they, they, they back, it, back it away from the ends. So because if there's any crack that's going to happen, it'll likely happen at the end of the component. So if this happens, then these are all the same net. So there's no short in this situation. So you're, you're kind of getting a lower density capacitor, but it, it'll, it'll at least fail in a safe way. So now uh, I'm going to talk about PCB design. And as a I guess reminder of this stuff, uh, the uh, governing standards body is the IPC, which is the Interconnecting Packaging Electronics Organization. So they define three different classes of PCB. Class two is the most common one by far. So anything you get from Oshpark or PCB Way or anything, that's going to be class two by default. Um, class three is uh, really safety critical things where if you're in a, like designing a missile or something and it, it needs to work um, when, you're, uh, when, when you need it to work, so you, you go with class three, or you have a satellite or something like that. So basically the difference in between class two and class three is the amount of uh, V a breakhouse that you're allowed to accept. And also there's uh, extra plating that is introduced be for class three. So there, there's some other things, but those are the, the main ones. And I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. Yeah. So I found that uh, automotive is commonly between class two and class three. So Class two, if you're making just some random consumer product, that's what you would get. But the like the big top tier automotive manufacturers, they'll decide that there's certain things that are important to them. Like they don't necessarily care that the the copper is plated thicker, but they do care about the V breakout. So uh, a V breakout is is uh, this kind of thing. So if you notice, this is a, a V structure, and the drill registration on the via, it's allowed to actually strike anywhere within that hole. So if this is uh, technically allowed with a normal class two design that you don't pay extra for. So you see that there's no, there's no annular ring outside of that thing. And that becomes a problem because if you run a trace right next to it, then you have the drill going right next to a trace, which it becomes kind of uh, questionable. But in class three design, there's a lot more inspection that has to take place, but the drill hit always has to be within the uh, pad of the via. So, here's that. So here's an example of uh, an ECU that I just pulled off an internet. And uh, one of the things you'll notice is that for uh, flexibility, uh, they uh, really like to use leaded components because they, uh, they can flex a little bit. There's no BGAs, there's no QFNs. They like using ceramic capacitors or the uh, Aluminum electrolytic, those are pretty popular. And they're, uh, they're not particularly dense circuit boards. So when I've been encountering different circuit board manufacturers, uh, I, I'm trying to, you know, I came from the iPhone world, so, so I'm trying to use VN, pad, like blind and buried, micro-Vs, things like that. 
and that, that kind of boggles their mind. They, they say, why would you want to do that? It's, so uh, to, just to convince them to use V in a tab is kind of a stretch. But, and here's another one where it's all lead to components. So uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much I had for you guys. Questions? How do you know what is going to be on the canvas? I mean, I, I can't imagine a fourth issue of documents this long that tells you all their protocols and all that. How do you know what's going on in the car? Um, are, you, are you designing an adjunct to an existing car? Or? So uh, I happen to work for the automotive manufacturer, so we get to define exactly what's on the bus. So it's not something we have to figure out, it's just something we get to define. So we'll define the uh, the body controller goes on this can, and so yeah. Are you only sending like hundreds of bits? Is that because there's not really any complicated instructions, right? Like we can test it out, we can test the way we did that. For for a lot of the things, there's a very low bus utilization, but um, given that you can go to uh, the the new Ethernet standard, there's uh, there's a lot more sensors that are becoming higher bandwidth especially as cars are becoming more automotive, more uh, autonomous. So there's a lot more uh, sonar, LiDAR sensors. And to fit into the same uh, wire lines. Basically, yeah. So you can put video over Ethernet just fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering, is there a big difference between uh, what electric cars need for their buses versus gas cars? Um, so a lot of the infrastructure is already built up for normal gas-powered cars, but obviously the uh, electric car doesn't have the same kind of electrical environment that a gas car would do because there's there's no alternator. Um, so we we're not really likely to experience the same kind of load dump or or um, like voltage ripple that kind of stuff. But uh, it is actually specified that an electric car has to be able to jump start a normal. Um, combustion engine car. So we still have to uh, design <laughs> to assume that the same kind of transients they see can also exist on the electric bus. So I mean, electric cars have a different electrical environment. So the battery will be maybe 400 volts or 700 volts, depending on the manufacturer. So I mean, there's, there's different things. And there's a lot more regulatory um, effort being put into the, the old combustion engine than there is on the electric car. Well, I think it's differently noisy. Yeah, because a, a gas car is not going to have high frequency switching converters that are changing 400 volts to 12 volts. So those are, it's, it's just different. But if you're designing a car, then you, if you go on DigiKey and you set your filter for automotive grade, then those components have mostly been designed assuming that you're, you're uh, working at Ford or whatever and designing an, uh, an ICE car. Okay, yeah. So, uh, in my ex from from what I understand, there's only one o diagnostic port, so that can be the ODB2 with the standard connector, or it doesn't have to be. The different manufacturers can make it Ethernet or whatever they think makes sense. But um, the purpose of the, uh, the the firewall component is to separate the internal car networks from the outside world. So if you imagine you're making a Tesla kind of a vehicle, you're going to have the internal networks. It's a CAN bus that talks to the brakes and the steering and the lights and, and the sensors and all that stuff. And that is, uh, is, is critical to the operation of the car. And it, it's really safety critical. But it also has access to the internet because you need to do over the air firmware validate, firmware updates. You need to do download maps. You might be downloading Spotify data. So that's kind of like kind of the untamed internet. So that firewall component is really the, the thing that separates the, uh, your Spotify downloading from the, uh, the drive-by-wire braking systems. Yeah, so that's kind of the purpose of uh, our company <laughs> and so Tesla too. So if the car manufacturers do their job right, then there should be no way that you can do that. So, 
So, and then uh, you're welcome to, I think uh, I've heard that there's, you're, you're welcome to try. And if you can do it, then points for you, but yeah. So with these modern cars that are half computer and have aluminum caps everywhere, what is the design lifespan? Um, I don't know who can answer that, but from what I've seen is that um, electronics, they always get tighter and smaller and more integrated. And the consumer electronics leads that, really. Like if you look at your iPhone or your uh, motherboard or anything like that versus the uh, electronic control units that I showed before. Um, so, I mean, there's um, a desire to increase um, the processing power in the in the car, so that's going to require high density interconnects. So they're going to have to figure out how to make more dense circuit boards and more dense components. Uh, I'm asking more about uh, like mean time before failure. Like we have cars from the 50s and 60s and 70s that still run. Yeah. But like a car manufacturer today, is it reasonable to expect that we can restore it to 2040 after these boards are no longer available? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I guess I would expect that to be less the case than the, the traditional cars, just because the pace of innovation is a lot, for it, a lot faster. So as a part of uh, building an automotive or buying an automotive component, they guarantee that you can buy it for 10 years. But let's say you're buying my, uh, my Neo car that I'm going to deliver next year, and uh, maybe NXP is only guaranteeing that I can buy that part for 10, 10 years. So they're not going to want to build like this power PC chip in you know, 2040, right? So there'll be, a, there'll be a point at which that it, it'll be an economic concern where you're not going to want to buy this part that was made in 2017 versus what could be designed in, in the future. So I think there'll be kind of a more of an economic obsolescence situation than there will be a, a, a component failing obsolescence. But then you can also make the argument that the semiconductors in use today are a lot smaller. So there's also uh, like electro migration and, and things like that. So those might wear out sooner than your relay that you're, you're dealing with in your, your Ford Comet or whatever. So, yeah. So do cars manufacturing um, make all these boards in-house or they come now or? So um, what I've been learning is that um, the car manufacturers, they really don't like to make their own circuit boards or they don't like to make their own modules. So they, they'd much rather deal with Bosch or this other company called Mag Magneti Morelli or you know Continental or pl people like that or Delphi, so they they would they would much rather buy a tested off-the-shelf module that they can bolt into their system, than they would want to design their own circuit board and then qualify that and package that and test that. So uh, that's why I kind of think uh, my company is very exciting because we're actually developing a lot of uh, unique original hardware, and uh, I guess I forgot to mention that we're still hiring. So if anybody's uh, looking for uh, hardware or software uh, opportunities, then uh, and find me afterwards. Yeah, and I say as a, as a new car company startup, we're very much following the Tesla model as opposed to the Ford model. Um, and I've only really been on my friend's Tesla one time, but uh, my understanding is that the uh, experience is a lot better where you, uh, you get new features all the time. Um, so I, I think there's going to be a lot of value proposition to the Tesla model where, where they own the software, they own the autonomous driving capability, they own the service and the sales and everything like that. So. I think that's a, that's a very, very attractive model going forward. So it's actually exactly Ethernet. All you have to do is instead of buying a, a four wire Ethernet Phi, you just buy the special two wire Ethernet Phi. So at the physical layer, that's the only difference. So the stack, you just use the same, you know, MII port or whatever you're using. So it's it's really like transparent to the developer. Well, so it's like I can install it and I can use that as the, the, the 
Yeah, it's, 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 it's just Ethernet. It's just like TCP IP networking. CAN is technically a multi-master protocol, so you, you physically can make it multi-master. So it, it really depends on how you want to architect the networks. So it, it might make more sense to have one computer in the, in the console someplace being the master of all the CANs, or maybe it makes more sense to make another module like in the, in the rear end of the car. Maybe that's the master of the, uh, you know, the, the, the lights and the, you know, the exhaust sensor or whatever else. So it really depends, but the, the, the protocol exists to let you do whatever you want to do. So it's, it's multi-master. It is a multi, yeah, it can is a multi-master, but Lin is not a multi-master. So the overall power consumption of the car, do you mean the, uh, the drive included? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so if you think about the, uh, the uh, Poodle standard, the power over data line standard I talked about before, the, uh, that, that kind of is intended for automotive applications where you're powering all the different uh, control modules over Ethernet, and that maxes out at 50 watts, so, um, which is uh, like at the high end of it. So every, every module will range somewhere between, like, most of them will be like under 10 watts, and there may be a couple of them that are up to 50. Um, but if you're uh, thinking about the kind of the more advanced autonomous driving computers, like the Mobileye or the NVIDIA, or stuff like that, those are, those are very high end uh, graphics application processors. So this can be, just in the processor itself, it can be like 50 watts by itself, so. Well, the, the power doesn't go over the can, but you need to run power to it separately. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking is if you're, a, if you have like a high-end NVIDIA processor, there's no way you're gonna power that over the data lines. So that's, you, you know, you gotta like basically plug that into the battery pack. Yeah. Are there uh, standards for doing firmware updates of only you and GPU, or are there, uh, like, can you do firmware updates for CAN and then decoder and use GPU as firmware updates? Or are they designed as like one hardware, one firmware? Um, I'm not sure if there's any standard, but. Uh, a lot of these CAN networks that I was referencing before, those should only be accessible if you're inside of the car. So you shouldn't, as a, some random person, be able to plug into that CAN bus and update the firmware. So. Okay, even for a Tesla or your car? Yeah. <laughs> software updates, can you update the firmware of the GPU? Or yeah, well, you know, the Tesla can update over the air. So that, that has a, an LTE cellular module. It can so download it. Oh, you mean can you update the module over the CAN bus? Like the board that you have on the screen, like yeah. the microcontroller, like yeah. is it designed so that the firmware can be upgraded or um, I'm actually not sure about that because I've uh, spent most of my time working kind of like on the on the host side of it. So I know the Last question? Okay, looks like we're good. Oh. Is there, is there any like IP based networking that's starting to get into CAN or does CAN look like it's going to be for 
no, the broader reach thing is going to, in my opinion, it's going to completely supplant Canvas. So the, the, the one pair Ethernet. So if, if you can run two wires for a Canvas, you can run two wires for this Ethernet protocol. And then you get 100 megabits instead of one megabit. And then you're dealing with TCP IP networking instead of the CAN stack. Anything in production? Um, well, there is a, I know there's files from several different companies you can buy, like from Broadcom and NXP. So I assume that there's cars already on the market that are using this uh, one wire Ethernet, but I, I, I can't give you any examples. So, yeah, cool. Thank you.